my childhood! So it may seem a little odd to do a review for the second game in a series when I haven't even covered the first, but Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil vale on the PS2 was one of my favourite games growing up. I love this game. If I had to make a list of the top five games I sunk the most time into during my childhood, it would probably go Jurassic Park Operation Genesis, Shadow of the Colossus, Dino Crisis 2, Soul Reaver 2, and finally Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil. Vale. Not my top most played, admittedly, but that's purely because the other games on that list are either longer, have more replayability, or even both. And that's saying something, given I've replayed Klonoa 2 at least 10 times in my life. Also, I've only just noticed how many 2s are on that list. I'm not sure why, perhaps the second game in a series tends to be more refined and improved, not always, but that's not what we're getting into in today's video, so let's not get sidetracked. Oh, and as a heads up, I will be spoiling major plot points in this review. I've rewritten this script a few times, one with virtually no story mentioned, and one with far too much. So I hope this ends up being a nice balance between the two. But yeah, spoilers, you have been warned. So, Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil, vale, a quirky and delightfully charming game that doesn't seem to get anywhere near the attention it deserves. Sure, a number of you guys have played or at least heard of the series, but outside of the internet, the times I have brought up the topic of Klonoa, I've never had anyone reply, oh yeah, the game with the bunny dude who shouts random gibberish. Instead, any mention I make of the series is usually followed by, what's a Klonoa? And then I have to sit there, awkwardly explaining it, while my unwilling subject looks more and more uninterested with each passing word. It's a shame, because I can guarantee if those very same people were to give the series just a little smidge of a chance, they would probably find themselves hooked. And yeah, I'm not going to deny that I have an extreme fondness for Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil, vale, but I'll try my best not to let that sway my review. And in fact, playing it through once again over, gosh, I don't know how long it's been, 15 years? I do have a few gripes with it this time around. Not massive gripes, mind you, but if there's something that's bugging me, I gotta make mention of it. And before we start, I do have to come clean about one thing. I have never played the first game, Klonoa Daughter Phantom Isle. Yes, it seems stupid to jump straight into the second game with no knowledge of the first, other than what I've seen in Let's Plays and Caddy's own review of it, but given Daughter Phantom Isle and Lunatea's Veil vale are treated as more or less separate stories, the second is a cherished childhood game of mine, and I just want to play something I know I'll enjoy that won't rot my brain. I hope you guys don't mind. Now, I can't find much information in terms of Klonoa 2's development, other than the bog-standard stuff on Wikipedia. It's a sequel, developed and published by Namco, or published by Sony Computer Entertainment for us stinking Europeans, and released in 2001, around three to four years after the original, depending on your region. Daughter Phantom Al is a bit richer on development backstory, but seeing as I'm not covering that game, at least not today, and I'm sure many of you saw Caddy's review of the first game, where he explained its history in much better detail than I ever could, I don't know what else to say. Other than this game is absolutely wonderful and adorable and addictive, and even the critics agree with me, and I can't understand why it's sold so poorly, what is wrong with people? So let's move on, shall we? Now, I'm not lying when I say this game is adorable. Before you even start your adventure, you get this delightful title screen opening, showing Klonoa running along a path surrounded by fields, before he jumps up at the screen with an enthusiastic <laughs> to which the title of the game reveals itself. Not only does this make me squee with nostalgic delight, it's actually a throwback to the original game's title screen opening. <laughs> which makes it all the more satisfying for old-time fans of the first game. Well, it looks cute now I fixed all the emulator issues I had. You should see the glitchy mess I had to deal with before I did some poking and prodding. What the fuck? There is still the odd texture glitch here and there, but it's nothing too dramatic and it's usually isolated to cutscenes. It's not just the main title screen that makes me go, oh. Check out the sound options and look at these cutie patooties. Thank goodness there's no such thing as death by cuteness, because this game would have done me in before I even got to the first level. 
Anyway, I can't spend all day gushing on about how sugary sweet the title screen is. I have a game to review. So, once you've chosen your name, a cutscene will play, showing Klonoa's arrival into the world of Lunatea. Now, I have to say, a lot of this game's story flew over my head as a kid. I didn't really understand its underlying themes of depression, sorrow, and self-doubt. As far as I was concerned, I was having a nice romp through a colourful, whimsical 2.5D land, and I certainly had no clue what this cryptic message at the beginning of the opening cutscene was on about. There's a forgotten dream? Have I forgotten the dream, or has the dream forgotten me? But surely there was a dream. Eh? Playing this through as an adult, however, especially with the knowledge I now have of the first game... Oh, it's referencing Klonoa's original adventure! I won't go into spoilers for those of you who haven't played Daughter Phantom Isle, and may want to in the future, but I tell you, that game has a doozy of a plot twist. Anyway, Klonoa is drifting through a black void of nothingness, when suddenly the screen fills with white, and a mysterious shadowy apparition calls out to him. By the way, he's not supposed to look like he's standing in a weird door frame. That's that's a glitch. Let me just let me just sort that. There we go. Let me just uh, draw that out. Yep. There we go. Carry on. Klonoa then falls into the ocean, but don't worry, everyone knows bunny people float. And as he does so, an aircraft flies overhead with two as of yet unknown figures aboard. Though one of them kind of looks like that bear from the game about killing people that everybody loves. Dangly Wumper, that's the one. Luckily, he doesn't get picked up by those shady looking feckers. Instead, he gets rescued by Digimon Reject here and anime waifu wannabe. A few introductions and one giant hungry piranha shark later, Hello. and it's time to begin the game. Ah, I'm so excited! Also, can we just take a moment to appreciate this gorgeous splash text? The way it ripples onto the screen, the fact levels are known as visions to go with the theme of dreams. Oh, my nostalgia! Now, one thing I love about this game is its simple controls. The only two mechanics you have are your jump ability, which can also have a short flap tacked onto it by way of Klonoa's ridiculously large ears, and the ring zap thingamajigger that he uses to hang off floating objects and even grab the most adorable little puddings you've ever seen in a game. I mean, look at these guys. Aww. 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 As cute as they are, though, given Klonoa is now in Lunatea, a completely different world to Phantom Isle, shouldn't we be seeing entirely new species? I'm not saying I don't love these little red moos, and yes, that's their official name, my heart is about to explode, but it would have been nice to see fresh-faced, fuzzy-wuzzy enemies for a new entry in the series, or even just more variety, with the latter, I have to admit, being a sticking point for me throughout Klonoa 2. Most areas you visit will have the same enemies, and while some of them are designed around the theme of their level, they tend to just be reskins of previous enemies. It's not a big deal, I know, and whether I've seen a red move for the first time or the 211th time, I'll still go, ah. but variety is the spice of life after all. So these little guys are necessary in order for Klonoa to progress through each level and complete puzzles. With the power of his ring, and Lolo inside it, as without her he can't do that zappy thing, he can grab various enemies and use them to perform a double jump, throw them at various objects blocking his path, 
and even use them to defeat bosses later on. And different types of enemies can have different effects. For example, the Boomy will explode after a set amount of time, useful for destroying blocks regular enemies can't remove, or for flipping switches for platforms. The Herbal causes Klonoa to launch into the air in a burst of electricity when used for double jumping, nifty for reaching areas too high for Bunny Dude, or breaking through blocks above his head. If you're going for all the collectibles, particularly the stars that contain parts of broken dolls scattered throughout almost every level, you're definitely going to need help from the various enemies that inhabit the place, as most stars are in awkward to reach areas or are well hidden, with some even appearing inside invisible eggs that can only be seen once you walk into them, and can only be broken open by throwing an enemy at them. That's not the only collectible either. Each level has 150 gems to track down, and collecting every single one will unlock a piece of concept art for the scrapbook, located in Momet House. Now, like most games I play, I did go into Klonoa 2 with the intention of at least trying to 100% it, and I wasn't doing too badly for the most part, until I hit the first board level. Now, don't get me wrong, I adore these levels, and they're one of the most entertaining breakaway vehicle sections I've ever experienced in any game. They're not that complicated either, instead relying on the exact same mechanics you've used before, only this time the board is doing the movement while you occasionally steer. Trying to go for 100% completion, however? <laughs> it certainly doesn't help, that missing a collectible means you either have to deliberately kill Kanoa before the next checkpoint to try for it again, or completely restart the level. And as far as I remember, and this could be horribly wrong so don't quote me on it, but I think restarting means all the gems and stars you found so far on that level get reset too, so you have to hunt every single one down all over again. How about new? To be fair, this isn't an issue that solely plagues the board levels, it affects every level that has gems and stars to collect. And I lost count of how many times I had one star piece left to find, only to realise I'd reached the end of the level and had no way of backtracking to find it. And if that weren't annoying enough, you'll frequently spend a good chunk of time carefully progressing through a complicated platforming section and grabbing every gem in the vicinity, only to miss time a zap on one of those floating orb things, watch helplessly as Klonoa falls to his death, and then load back in at the last checkpoint, with all the gems back where they were. Which means you have to do all that precarious platforming once again. Luckily, collecting gems isn't necessary to progress further through the game, meaning you can avoid some of the more awkward platforming, take your time, and enjoy the absolutely gorgeous visuals Klonoa 2 has to offer. I mean, look at these levels. There is so much vibrancy, life and whimsiness in each one that it's hard not to crack a smile as you take it all in. And while levels do share certain themes, each has its own look and feel that makes it truly unique. Even levels you have to revisit as the story progresses offer new enemy placements, puzzles and environmental hazards. For example, the first time I visited Lalakusha, it was a beautiful, serene land of waterfalls, sparkling caves and... Okay, he's a bit out of place, but you get the idea. When you visit it after everything goes to shit, however, the land has darkened, the caves are full of noxious gas and... Nope, you're still out of place, I don't like you, and stop eating the adorable little moose! Even the first level has a moderate change-up later on, going from being piss easy to get through due to it being a tutorial level, to oh my god, it's so dark I'm going to die. Also, invisible fire. Unfortunately, this is one of the few emulation glitches that as of yet there is no fix for, but seeing as fire rarely comes up as a hazard, it's not a game-breaking problem. I suppose I should get on with the story really, shouldn't I? So, once you make it to the end of the first level, Popka will instruct you to ring the rusty old bell located at the base of the statue. It turns out the bell is of a spiritual nature, and only priestesses with enough power will be able to ring it.
Oh no, she's not one of those characters, is she? The trio then head off to visit Baguji, a seemingly wise old man wearing an ice cream cone on his head, and he gives Klonoa a bit of backstory into the world of Lunatea. So the land is split into four different kingdoms, Lalakusha, the Kingdom of Tranquility, Joyland, the Kingdom of Joy, Volk, the Kingdom of Discord, and Mira Mira, the Kingdom of Indecision. Each kingdom houses its own harmony bell, and it's with the power these bells contain that peace is kept throughout the land of Lunatea. Somehow. I don't know, the game never really specifies what these powers actually do or how they'll help, only that they will contain the evil, which is a very broad term if you ask me. It's revealed by Baguji, however, that a fifth bell has made itself known. Sorry, don't mean to interrupt, but this bell must be the cause of the chaos. Not the bell that's all to do with discord, residing in the kingdom that's constantly at war, or even the bell in the kingdom of xenophobic people who can't make a bloody decision on anything. Couldn't be those bells, no? <laughs> Monsters. Anyway, you can probably guess what direction this is heading in. Klonoa must help Lolo make her way to each kingdom and obtain the power of each bell, which the game refers to as elements. Before they can do so, however, they must visit the High Priestess in order to make Lolo a fully-fledged priestess. Not just, like, an intern, you know? And while Klonoa murders yet more of the Moo populace on his way to her, let me take this opportunity to discuss the soundtrack of Klonoa 2. Playing this through once again and having more appreciation for the finer aspects of gaming, I can honestly say this is one of the best video game soundtracks I've ever heard in my life. I don't think there's any song in Klonoa 2 that gets irritating after repeated listening, and each one does a fantastic job of setting the mood of the level they're themed upon. Not surprising, really, given Klonoa 2 had eight different composers dedicated to making its amazing soundtrack. One thing I especially love is when the music changes up slightly to suit the environment. In Lalakusha, for example, upon entering a cave, the wonderfully relaxing theme goes from this... To this. Oh, it sounds so sparkly, I love it! Much sightseeing, spelunking and destruction of property later, we finally arrive at the Temple of the High Priestess. Now, I understand Stoner Chick hears the head honcho and she gets to decide which girls become full priestesses, and that apparently boils down to receiving a fancy feather in your hat. But did Dopey Ginger really need this status in order to save the world? What is the role of a priestess in Lunatea anyway? Is it just ringing bells on occasion? Could she not have gathered the power of the bells as only a half-priestess? Yet more questions Klonoa 2 unfortunately never really answers, which makes for another issue I have with the game, and is partly the reason I was completely clueless as to what was going on when I first played this 15 years ago. My god, she is baked. 
This leads on to the first boss fight of Klonoa 2, and an introduction to the two feckers we saw at the beginning of the game. Oh no, Tumblr OCs. Lirina is after Klonoa's ring for as of yet unknown reasons, but given the trio aren't in a sharing mood, she opts to set her mechanical monstrosity upon them for their defiance. Now, bosses in this game are a bit of a doddle. Sure, I have an advantage from the many times I've fought them in previous playthroughs, but most boil down to jump to avoid their extremely predictable attacks, throw a moo at their very obvious weak points, for massive damage, bish bash bosh, and the fight is done. And if you're quick enough, you can take an entire bar of health off the boss before they even launch an attack. Folgaran the armor beast here didn't do anything for the first phase, except spin in a merry little circle, and even the second phase only had him spreading his arms out as a means of attack. Many moves to the butthole later, and Folgaran was defeated. Slightly anticlimactic, but let's not forget it is a game aimed at kids. So, boss fight over, Lee Arena and Tack get away in their fancy airplane, and the trio are left in peace to collect the first element, tranquility. And that's pretty much the gist of the game. You visit Ice Cream Man on occasion who will tell you where to go, wind up in a new kingdom, finish the levels of said kingdom, fight a big bad boss who's actually a bit of a pushover, collect the element, and start the process all over again. Luckily, the game never feels stale, as each kingdom has its own unique looks and brings with it new mechanics. My personal favourite is Joyland, a kingdom themed like one giant amusement park. Oh, I can't wait to see it again! Oh. Oh no, oh no 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 no, please, anywhere but here. Unfortunately, this is one of the areas most affected by those graphical glitches I told you about, and try as I might, I couldn't get rid of these ones. Like I said, it's usually limited to cutscenes, and it's not that extreme an issue, but it is disappointing to have such a gorgeous area spoiled by wacky flashing textures. The goal in this kingdom is to catch the Tat doppelgangers, who've stolen the element Klonoa and company only received moments ago. Tat 
rats will split herself into two and go to various areas. One to the Jungle Slider, and one to the Joyland Fun Park. It doesn't matter which you go after first, as it's the one you don't choose to pursue that has the element in her furry little paws. Given nostalgia was kicking me hard by this point, I chose Jungle Slider, as it's the first board level of the game. Can't say that, this is a kid's game! So it's on to Joyland Fun Park where the real culprit awaits. And this level. Oh my childhood! I'm sorry I keep saying that, but this game is giving me warm, bubbly feelings and I can't help myself. And look! This level's got its own shooting range with goodie filled eggs, non stop fireworks, roller coasters, and of course, the Piste de Resistance, a creepy haunted mansion, complete with themed rooms, giant Frankenstein moos, spooky music, and this guy. This level also contains a bit of dialogue between Klonoa and Tat that's slightly surprising to hear. So you mean to tell me these little guys are perfectly happy to be used and abused and then just disappear forever? Like they have one purpose in life and once that purpose is fulfilled, that's it. They can just die happy? Why is this sounding so familiar? I'm Mr. Meeseeks, look at me! Once you find this tat at the end of the haunted mansion, another chase begins. Though not as fun as the last one, sadly. Back to the main plaza and oh, bloody glitches! Oh yeah, and there's a clown now. Another trip to Ice Cream Man and we're sent off to the Kingdom of Volk, a land in constant war with itself. It's here the trio find out that Liarina is using the data she collected from Klonoa's fight with Leptio to make a copy of his ring. And she's powering this ring by using Volk's two reactors, with no care for the risk they'll overload. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 
Polunia, Abumi, Yamo? Meet us. Not down. Puna has a clutch. That's work not done. Sufana Rengarcha, Kulunia Ferdinand. <gasps> That's just evil! Leorina sends Tap to check on both reactors, and the trio follow after her. The first level I visited was the underground factory, an area filled with machinery, conveyor belts, and lava. There's always bloody lava. This also appears to be where the inhabitants of Volk build their armies, and this is another thing I love about Klonoa 2, the amount of detail going on in the background. Here we see the beginnings of a mechanical soldier, starting off in an egg before hatching, being outfitted with armour, placed in a tank, and then finally into a bomb for convenience of delivery onto some poor, unsuspecting town. Honestly, it's touches like this that really give a game life and it makes it even more enjoyable to play through multiple times. You'll finally catch up with Tat, who will pick a fight with you, using giant whack-a-mole versions of herself to shoot orbs at Klonoa. It's a bit of a snore fest as all you really do is occasionally jump to avoid the orbs, grab a moo and throw it at one of the dummies, all the while waiting for the rotating platform to slowly get into position. One disappointing sub-boss defeated, a bit more platforming over precarious pits of lava, and you'll reach the first reactor which Klonoa switches off. So it's on to the city itself, a level that starts out similar to the previous with underground tunnels and sewers, but eventually brings you above ground into a war-torn metropolis. This is another level with awesome background details. As you make your way through the city, you'll watch as the bombs we saw earlier are dropped onto houses, forcing its inhabitants to flee for cover. Planes fly overhead, and places of interest are completely decimated, all in the name of war. One of my favourite details, however, is the view you get of the sprawling city and its towering reactor as you sail through the sky. Ooh, I feel like a tiny little bug in a forest of destruction! One glitchy train ride later, and the trio arrive at the second reactor in time to switch it off. They then head back to the main hall to try and steal the fake ring, but are stopped short by yet another boss. I have to admit, this was the first time a boss fight in Klonoa 2 actually felt slightly challenging. Fishkash here will launch slow flying, heat seeking rockets all over the place, and jump up and down to try and smush Klonoa flat. All while you're trying to grab a flying moo, jump on a bouncy platform, avoid the flying rockets, and still launch said moo into Bishkash's stupid big vent on his head. But that means... Oh, <gasps> could she be a priestess? The 
aluminium wheels and screws. Satomat Daniel screws at level of length. Lee Arena does her evil villain laugh as she walks away, and the trio realise, while it may be a shitty place to live, it's gonna be a whole lot shittier if they don't stop the reactor from overloading. So it's back to the city, which is more or less the same layout, only this time Bishkash is back, and with a vengeance. It's an entertaining, if not slightly panic-inducing level, especially if you're trying your best to collect all the gems and star pieces, and this is another issue that plagues Klonoa too at times. When you're patient and taking the level at your own pace, the platforming works beautifully. The second you need to do anything in a rush, however, it all comes apart. It's not a big issue early in the game, but once you get to sections like this, where speed and precision is key, Bishkash is finally dealt with via a swift choo-choo train to the face, and the trio are free to switch off the reactor. Another visit to Bagaji, who informs them access to Mira Mira will be difficult due to the kingdom not taking too kindly to strangers. But you know what? Why don't you get this rusty old bucket of an arc running and use that to get there instead? I'm sure nobody in Mira Mira will notice an arc the size of five football stadiums making its way across the border. Now, this is one of the longest levels of the game, and as a kid, I hated it. Mainly because I'd always get stuck on the puzzles involving crystals! Said crystals need to be destroyed by way of these cute little critters, who can absorb other moves to gain power, and the colour of the glow the crystal gives off is a hint to how many moves you need to absorb. Yellow is one, blue is two, and red is three. Like I said, I hated this mechanic as a kid, but that's due to the fact I wasn't great at thinking outside the box, a trait you'll definitely need for puzzles of this variety in later levels. Nowadays, I appreciate the challenge much more. So, the goal in the arc is to make your way to three different engines, complete a puzzle involving the crystal critter, and get all three running again. Doing so will give you access to these weird little red switches, zap them all to turn on the arc's propellers, and it's on to the mountains of Mira Mira, a level with the catchiest theme tune I've ever heard in a game. Reaching the end of the slope, the trio notice a strange building perched atop a plateau, and this is the beginning of one of the oddest levels of Klonoa 2. Strange, cryptic inhabitants, mirrors on every wall that laugh at you as you walk past, topsy-turvy puzzles that are guaranteed to make your head spin, and it's one of my favourite levels in the entire game due to the message it portrays. You see, this odd building is full of people's memories. The inhabitants here refuse to leave, as in their eyes, why would they need to when they can just relive memories of the past? <laughs> It's here that Lolo, the ditzy dope who's had me rolling my eyes up until this point, finally gets me to feel empathy for her, as she reflects on her own past in one of the creepiest cutscenes this game has to offer. <laughs> Turns out 
turns out Lola has been wrestling with her own fears and self-doubt about being truly capable of saving the world, and it's something that's plagued her since she first began her training in priestesshood. As she breaks free of the awful memory, she shares her feelings of self-doubt with the others, stating it was Klonoa's power, not hers, that made it possible for her to ring the spiritual bell way back in the beginning of the game, and her sadness carries on into the next level, Indecision Pass, where her own fears of being a failure stop her from being able to help Klonoa during the next boss fight against Polonte the Hatchling. <laughs> After a swift talking to by Popka, however, who reminds Lola that she can't just give up and the least she can do is try for Klonoa, who isn't even from this world but he's giving it everything he's got to save it, she snaps out of her melancholy and jumps back into the fight. It's something I never took notice of as a child that really hits home now as an adult, and makes me appreciate Klonoa too even more than I ever did. We all have our own fears and self-doubts, we all feel like failures at times, and that's perfectly fine as long as we persevere. With the final bell visited and the element obtained, the trio head back to Baguji. アブターマンクルアルアムトラン。アルドアンヨリアクズ。パオ。アウグモクパワワギャン。ユアブニア。ドアブ。バナアマントフィギュア。ワールドエズグルムヨアランダ。Now, this was something, once again, that Klonoa 2 disappointed me with. After that whopper of a reveal we got with Lolo, I was curious to see what Lyrina could possibly mean. I will make them pay? The ones who abandoned me? Oh, I smell an awesome villain backstory coming up! <laughs> Yes. Well, we'll need to downward Windyama. Please, could I not mention Wimuya? Leo? 
What? Is that it? So she was fed up with how long her training was taking and decided to go it alone. How boring is that for a villain backstory? Also, I thought only full priestesses could ring the bells, that's why we made Lolo one, no? If Liarina left her training early, surely she isn't a full priestess. Plot holes game, plot holes! Anyway, we cut back to Liarina, who's doing some naughty shit, using the elements to destroy the statue we originally came across way back in the beginning of the game. The fifth bell! And so, Klonoa and company set off to try and stop Liarina once and for all. Bye, stoner lady! You were only in the game for like, five minutes, but I guess you were okay. We're brought back to the very first level, but it's all dark and shit, and going in the dark means doom! So you'll have to make use of these glowing little cuties that will bathe Klonoa in light for a short time. Klonoa finally makes his way to Liarina, but not before she rings the fifth bell. All the bells suddenly ring out in unison. The sea of tears turns into a sea of piss, and a mysterious second arc appears above the original, before disappearing in a golden glow and reappearing above the new bell. Here comes another board level! So, the entire sea has just evaporated apparently, leaving Klonoa no choice but to surf sand dunes while avoiding tornado spitting boulders, falling into sarlacc pits, and being squished by crumbling statues. As he makes his way to the Ark above, that mysterious voice he's been hearing throughout the game calls out once again, only much more urgent than before. And it's here in the embryo compass, okay, that we fight my favourite boss of the entire game. It's a simple fight, yes, they all are, but the reasons that bring it about, the music that plays, the friggin' cutscene before it, ah! You know what, I'm just going to be quiet, let you watch it, and you can judge for yourself how awesome it is. Oh, <laughs> 
Arena's fight will have her running around the platform both she and Klonoa stand on. The first phase involves launching Klonoa into the weak point on her stomach with the aid of herbals. The second phase will have her latch onto the underside of the platform, requiring moves to be slammed into the glowing segments when she passes underneath them. And finally, she will transform into a darker version of her cursed self, with this phase similar to the first. return to normal, and it's time for another pity party. Oh yeah, sure, I'll clean up the mess you bloody made. So it's back to the Ark to shut off the engines before it can connect the Kingdom of Sorrow to the rest of Lunatea. It's more or less the same as when you first visited. It's a race against the clock, however, as destroying an engine will set off a chain reaction of explosions, and if Klonoa isn't outside by the time the entire engine goes up in one mega blast, it's bye bye, Bunny Boy. and Tat will drop Klonoa at the other two engines, and once all three are destroyed, the group will escape as the Ark crashes to the land below, but not before it creates a path into the Kingdom of Sorrow. By the way, I'm still not seeing how Sorrow is any worse than Discord or Indecision, just saying game. The Arena informs us there is still time to save Lunatea if we defeat the King of Sorrow, and so the trio make their way through one of the strangest kingdoms yet. A land bathed in constant sunset, with no inhabitants other than the king himself, and a palace suspended high in the air amongst some of the oddest architecture Klonoa 2 has on offer. It actually appears to be a mix of buildings and landscapes that we've seen before throughout Lunatea, all fragmented and mixed together, and this theme has influence over the music for this area too. Every so often, you'll hear clips of music from other levels, and apparently if you play this theme backwards, you can also hear a clip from the Curse Lee Arena boss fight. By the way, this is one of those levels that will make you hate yourself if you're attempting 100% completion. The platforming can be so finicky and easy to mess up at times that your sanity will drain just a little bit more every time you watch Klonoa fall to his doom. Much hair pulling and cursing profusely later, you'll finally make it to the castle above. Klonoa whips the board out once more, and we're off down what seems to be a completely separate dimension, with floating fragmented platforms and tunnels, piping spewing out flames, and all surrounded by a black void of nothingness. Very fancy.
Yumurabi, Digu, Popuna Manifi, Tua Ucha, Dufu Popo, Dupure Mari, Anna Pakua. Oh, no, not another Tumblr OC. Pepstona, Piguna video, Yumu, Lurutia Auda, Oninana Manife Purto, Manurada. What a twist! And there's Klonoa 2 hitting us again with yet more thought provoking dialogue. So it turns out the Kingdom of Sora was always a part of Lunatea, but people shut Sora out of their lives, causing it to disappear from the world forever. <laughs> <gasps> it ties into the title! And the twists keep on coming. Turns out Ice Cream Man never really existed and was just an extension of the King of Sorrow. And it was the King of Sorrow himself who brought Klonoa the Dream Traveller to the world of Lunatea. Bear in mind guys, this is a kid's game. The story, the plot twists, the dialogue here, this is deep stuff man. No wonder I had no bloody clue what was going on all those years ago. And so, the final boss battle of Klonoa 2 begins. The first phase is a mix of the previous board level that had you racing down spiral tunnels, and the fight with Palonte the Hatchling. Throw these weird things at this even weirder, bigger thing, and you'll move into another cutscene. The King of Sorrow will do his oh woe is me routine, Lyrina will turn up and say there ain't enough room for two whingy antagonists in this game, and she'll give Klonoa the final element she took way back in Volk. And on to the final phase. The King of Sorrow will shield himself with a force field while sending spiked objects hurtling towards Klonoa. Pick these up and use them against the King by hitting the shield's weak points. Repeat 48,000 times and you're done! ラクルド。ウィン。ウィンナ。ラクルド。ユラバ。パラミュー、ツナンドゥヤ。パラミュー、ツナンキュキャフ。ニュムリナ、ウィナラクルド。ニュムフィナエルナオのトラフィ。ユムル。ウラ。ウエブラ。ディ、ユトロンコリナ、
If you say so, I mean, we don't really know anything about the goddess Claire, other than she was a nice lady who got purged of all evil. More plot holes, or perhaps a translation issue, I don't know. Anyway, we move on to the final scene that sees Lyrina helping rebuild the Kingdom of Sorrow, and Klonoa saying goodbye to his friends. Lunatea isn't his world after all, and there are undoubtedly more dream worlds out there that need his help. There's a heartfelt and I'm sure very snotty hug between Klonoa and Lolo, and the dream traveller finally walks away, slowly disappearing into a ripple of white light. And then there's supposed to be credits with delightful little pictures showing what happened after Klonoa's departure, but my emulated copy decided that was enough for one day. But this is what you're supposed to see. Learina rebuilding the Kingdom of Sorrow, a bunch of random inhabitants doing random things, the factory in Volk now manufacturing boards instead of soldiers, the city being rebuilt with the aid of inhabitants from all over Lunatea, and my personal favourite, the High Priestess holding a newborn baby very similar in looks to the King of Sorrow. Oh, and he's smiling, he's finally happy! Oh, this game just makes you so warm and fuzzy inside. So now I've talked at great length about Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil, vale, what do I think about it? Short answer, feckin' awesome. Long answer, I think it's a brilliant title from the early 2000s that catered to multiple demographics. If you were a kid when you first played this, you probably just saw it as a fun and easy to get into 2.5D platformer and didn't pay much attention to the story. That's fine. If you were somebody who wanted a deep, meaningful and thought-provoking adventure but didn't want to be bogged down by difficult platforming and tough puzzles, that's fine too. You just went through the basics and plodded your way from A to B. And if you're somebody who wanted a bit of everything, amazing story, entertaining yet simple gameplay, puzzles that would leave you scratching your head, collectibles, you got more or less everything you wanted with this game. Sure, it's not without its issues, and I covered a great deal of them in this review, but with enjoyable and straightforward gameplay, beautiful graphics, interesting characters, one of the most gorgeous soundtracks that's ever been created for a game, and a compelling and emotional story as stimulating as this one, you can easily look past the problems it does have and see it as a delightfully quirky and addictive little game that really deserved much more attention than it ever received. And that's my review of Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil. Vale. It went on for a lot bloody longer than I initially planned, but I suppose that's always going to happen when talking about a game with as interesting a story as this one has. I really hope you guys enjoyed listening to me ramble on and on and on, and if you did, please leave a like as it really helps me out. And if any of you have played this wonderful title, or just want to talk about it a little bit more with me, let me know what you thought of it in the comments section. Thank you so much for watching guys, and peace out! Shout out to supporters, Klaxon, Thomas Hinton, Jeffrey Thomas, Ray Zach, Mr. Zugador, Ross Ward, Samuel DeBoss, Poplio the Destroyer, Morendor, Trevor, and Oblivion. Thank you to everyone who continues to support the channel on Patreon or on YouTube with memberships. I really appreciate every donation, no matter how small, it really, really helps me out. And if you can't donate, that's perfectly fine too. The fact that you continue to watch videos, no matter what I produce, whether it's reviews, vlogs, let's plays, anything, the fact you guys come back, watch the whole thing, leave a like, leave comments, recommend the videos to other people, that means so, so much to me and it really helps the channel grow. So thank you once again to the donators, to the people who come back and watch everything I make, to the people who leave comments, I love you all, thank you so much, and ta-ta!